morning first thing. All throughout scripture, we see the importance of both knowing and believing the gospel message ourselves and being able to share that message with others. God expects us to be able to tell people how they can have their sins forgiven, how they can enjoy eternal and abundant life, and how they can be made right with him. In Luke chapter 14, for instance, our Lord Jesus is talking. And he says that the master said to his servants, Go out into the highways and hedges and compel them to come in, that my house may be filled. In 2 Corinthians chapter 5, the apostle Paul teaches. He says that God is reconciling the world to himself through Christ, not counting their trespasses against them, and that he's made us the ambassadors of his message of reconciliation, and that we're supposed to go out and share that message with others and urge them to be reconciled to God. Over in Romans chapter 10 as well, Scripture teaches us that faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. Now, research indicates that Christians know the importance of sharing their faith with others. About three-fourths of Christians say that they realize they have a direct responsibility to share the gospel with those around them. But 50% of Christians have not shared their faith with anyone in the last year. And the vast majority of Christians have never led anyone to Christ. Some common reasons that we don't share the gospel involve that we're just intimidated by the idea of doing it. We feel that we're going to be judged for our faith or we just simply don't know how to share the gospel. Here at FBC, we would like to help you with that. It's our intention to empower you and enable you to share the gospel confidently with anyone that the Lord puts in your path. So on Sunday, April 7th, Three weeks from today, we are going to be kicking off a course in evangelism training. This will be following the worship service over in the Gorecki room. Learn how to have a gospel conversation with anyone. Learn how to reach anyone with the gospel and learn how to do it effectively and confidently. This course is going to be offered to everyone free of charge. It will run through the month of April, so it's not a huge time commitment. But I think that everyone who commits to it will have their lives and their faith changed permanently. I really hope that you'll consider joining us for this training. Again, it's going to kick off on Sunday, April 7th, after the worship service, and then go through the month of April. After that, we're going to give you many concrete opportunities to share the gospel with your friends and loved ones right here in Franklinville, right here in our own backyard, and tell them how they can have the hope and the eternal life that you currently possess as a gift from the Lord Jesus Christ and made possible because of his work. Please pray about this and please give it some thought. If you have any questions, me and the elders are always here to talk. Thank you. Good morning, church family. All throughout scripture, we see... Good morning. Good morning. Thank you for bearing with me. Um, one of my least favorite things to do is listen to myself in a recording. <laughs> or watch a video of myself. I honestly don't know how y'all do it every week. Uh, <laughs> but I, I'm really excited about what we're offering. And the reason I did that is because it, it's just too much to explain, you know, right here during the announcement time. But that kicks off three weeks from today. Uh, I really hope that you'll be a part of it. Learn how to share the gospel with someone. Get confident, comfortable sharing the gospel with people. Uh, we want to give you the tools to be successful in that. Uh, a couple other announcements we have. Today is the committee heads uh, meeting after today's service over in the Gorecki room just for a few minutes there, so please join us if you're available. Uh, next Sunday on March 24th from 6 to 8, we're holding our uh, JYC downtown youth group. That's for all our 6th uh, through 12th graders, so please come and be a part of that as well. On, uh, by March 31st, if you're participating in the succulent arrangement party, uh, please sign up. You can do that by contacting Lisa or Loretta. I believe the cost is $15, right? Uh, so please check that out. That should be a really good time of fellowship as well. And now Miss Cassie has an announcement about our upcoming chicken barbecue. So every year we do a chicken barbecue as a fundraiser for Camp JYC. It's always a really amazing time. It's a lot of work, um, but we have a lot of fun doing it and we make a lot of money for camp. So I'm here to say that the signups are available. I'm going to hang them in the back here and just wanted to kind of walk through all the different ways we ask people to um, step out and help with this event. So firstly, we need people to come and cook the chickens at the pit. So flipping the chickens, helping with that whole process. Um, so there's a sign-up sheet for that specifically. 
Um, we ask people to come and work in the kitchen, and so this is after the chickens are cooked, um, packaging up the meals and getting them ready to go out the door to the people who are purchasing them. And we ask people to, ahead of time, bake cookies. Um, and we kind of are specific about what we ask. We ask that you don't make cookies that have nuts or um, peanut butter or anything like that. And we specifically are looking for chocolate chip cookies. And I even printed out lots of recipes that you can just grab one of these recipes um, and use this. And so it's kind of uniform. Everybody's getting the same, um, the same product. So directions are here uh, at the top. If you have any questions, please just come and ask me about that. Um, so three different ways. And then also, um, order chicken because it's delicious and it helps camp. So you can go online to campjyc.org. It's a really quick and easy um, form to fill out and reserve your chickens. If you don't have internet access or this seems overwhelming to you, just come and see Martin or myself or really anyone who's on the camp team and we'll help you reserve your chickens. So make sure you check out these sign-up sheets that are hanging in the back. Today is the third Sunday of the month, which means we're highlighting a missionary that we support by giving uh, to the IMB. So this month's missionary couple to pray for is the Lee family, Richard and Karen Lee. Uh, our church is happy that we're supporting them. They're doing missions work in Tanzania, East Africa. They are based in a city called Dar es Salaam, which is Tanzania's largest city with several million residents. Most of their time is spent reaching people for Christ and teaching the Bible. Southern Baptist missionaries are trying to reach about 55 unreached people groups across the continent of Africa. And so in the next several years, this mission challenge is going to be huge. But Richard and Karen have also enjoyed reaching out to Southern Baptist churches in America, especially African-American ones. When African-American missionaries walk up to the front of the church, there's great excitement in these churches. All sorts of people are needed to serve as missionaries. Richard recalls a similar response when they first arrived in Tanzania. Local Africans were amazed, and then they were quite happy that people who looked like them had come. Richard likes to quote Revelation 7, which describes the great multitude of all kinds of people who are gathered around to praise Jesus. Remember, the Apostle John is given this vision of the throne room, and he says, every tribe, tongue, people group is there, represented, lifting praises to God in unity. So this month, let's think of Richard and Karen. Let's ask the Lord to bless them as they reach people in Tanzania, that they would see many souls come to Christ and that they would be able to teach the gospel effectively. Thank you. Good morning, everyone, again. Shall we stand for the call to worship? <clears throat> Reading Colossians chapter 3 this morning, starting in verse 12. Therefore, as the elect of God, holy and beloved, put on tender mercies, kindness, humility, meekness, long-suffering, bearing with one another and forgiving one another. If anyone has a complaint against another, even as Christ forgave you, so you also must do. But above all these things, put on love, which is the bond of perfection, and let the peace of God rule in your hearts, to which also you were called in one body, and be thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms, and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. And whatever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. Let's pray. Father, for your amazing grace, we are thankful this morning that you have called us all together to worship you in spirit and in truth. May we do that in our singing, in our conversations, in the preaching, all 
we do would be honoring and glorifying to you. Bless and encourage us, strengthen us to do the will that you've called us to do in this community, to share the good news that Jesus has come and he is ours and we offer him to those around us. We pray in Jesus' name, amen. Take a minute now, please, and greet those around you, if you would. Thank you.
If you can start making your way back to your seats as we continue worshiping the Lord through song this morning.
Thank you, Susanna, for joining us this morning. We have one more song. My worth is not in what I own. satisfied through you alone. Father, we pray that we come humbly before you today. Lord, open our hearts that we may hear the word that you have brought today. Father, we pray these things in your holy name. Amen. Welcome. Good morning. Good morning. <laughs> welcome. I'd like to welcome you back. Uh, yes, kids, you can follow Miss Amber to practice for the bell choir, please. I'd like to welcome you back to our uh, series in our church's covenant. And we're in part four. We've been looking at this for about a month now, working bit by bit through the things that we've committed to and why they're still important today. Uh, one thing that I had forgotten to announce during our announcement time was on Easter Sunday, we'll be holding a baptism service. So if you've received Jesus as your Lord and Savior, but you've never been baptized and you feel the call of God to take that public step of obedience, please come and see me or one of the elders. We would love to baptize you here on Easter Sunday. Obviously, we know that uh, it's not baptism that makes us right with God, but it is a public declaration of the fact that we follow him 
and that we believe in him. Now, over the last few weeks, as I said, we've been taking this very in-depth look at the beliefs and the commitments that make this church this church. These, these statements that, that make us unique, that make us who we are. Remember, every church has something that is their heartbeat. When we follow this covenant, what we're saying is this is what makes us FBC. Now, as you can remember, this, uh, this covenant was initially drafted and it was adopted at our church's very first organizational meeting all the way back in October of 1825. So we're coming up here next year on the 200th anniversary of our existence as a church family. And what we have to do now, all these years later, is we have to see why this covenant is still important today, right? We don't want this to just be uh, a historical relic. We don't want it to just be something that has some cool perspective. But because of the scriptural truth that it contains... And because of the, strict, the scriptural backing that goes into it, we understand that the covenant is still very important today and we need to take a look at it and see how we can put it into practice. I want to invite you to open your Bibles, please, to Ephesians chapter 4. And as you do that, I'll read the very next commitment that we find here. Uh, and it's in the second paragraph of this covenant. It says, We engage, therefore, to strive for the advancement of this church in knowledge holiness, and comfort, and to promote its prosperity and spirituality, to strive for the advancement of this church in knowledge, holiness, and comfort, and to promote its prosperity and spirituality. Now, this commitment is a little bit more complicated than what some of the ones that we've looked at in the past. We're a little bit more straightforward, right? This one's a little bit more, uncom this one's a little bit more tricky to kind of uncover and to apply. But in the course of this sermon... I hope to answer two questions for you, really. The first is, what is God's vision for our church's advancement, right? What does advancement look like from God's perspective? Not what do we want it to look like or what does it mean to us? What is God's vision for a church's advancement from Scripture? How has he revealed that? The second is, what does this vision require of us or what does it demand of us as a church family? What are we going to have to do to make it a reality? I want to answer both of those questions for you. Now, as I said, our passage this morning is found in Ephesians 4. We're going to be in verses 13 through 16. And please have a look with me here, beginning in verse 13. Until we all attain to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, to mature manhood, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, so that we may no longer be children, tossed to and fro by the waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by human cunning, by craftiness and deceitful schemes. Verse 15, rather, speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in every way into him who is the head, into Christ, from the whole body joined and held together by every joint with which it is equipped. When each part is working properly, it makes the body grow so that it builds itself up in love. Man, there's a lot going on there. Here's my first, our first question. What is God's vision for our church's advancement, I believe that it's three things from Scripture. There's any number of things, actually, but we're focusing on three today. The first part of God's vision for our church's advancement, that we possess spirituality and maturity in increasing measure. That we possess spirituality and maturity in increasing measure. Now, when Scripture talks about a church's advancement, we see that God is mainly concerned with spiritual growth and spiritual death. He's mainly concerned with the church's increasing spiritual maturity, right? He wants each church to grow in their knowledge of his word. He wants each church to grow in his obedience to his word. And as the church is growing in those areas, he wants the individuals in the church to grow in their own lives as well, right? Healthy, growing individuals make for a healthy, growing church. This is what God wants. This is what God is mainly concerned with in the area of spiritual growth. A healthy church or a healthier church is simply one that is more faithful than it was at a previous point in time. Now, this is oftentimes the opposite. It's the opposite of what we think about when we think about healthy, growing churches, right? Usually when we think of a growing church, we think of a bigger building. We think of more people in the doors, more people in the pews. We think of more money in the offering plates. We think of more vibrant ministries. Lots of times we think in terms of numerical growth when we think about a healthier church. But that's not how Scripture describes healthy churches. 
Scripture describes healthy churches as being the most devoted to the Word of God, the most faithful to His commands for them, and the most loving in terms of fellowship. God's not really that interested from Scripture in a church's numbers. There are very small churches out there, very small in number, that would seem insignificant to the world, but in God's eyes, they're very healthy. On the other hand, there are really large, mega churches, sometimes, that are extremely unhealthy from a spiritual perspective. Many times, if we look at these things, we find that our expectations for a healthy church are shaped more by culture and not by the Word of God. We find that our expectations for a healthy church are shaped by the world's expectations, not what God has taught, right? We should never necessarily be asking ourselves, how do we get more people in the doors on Sunday? How do we get more people in the pews? We should be asking ourselves, how do we obey God more? How do we show more faithfulness to God? How do we deepen our dedication to the Lord? This is what God is looking for. Now take a look with me here at Ephesians 4, which is one of the clearest passages on healthy churches. And here we get a glimpse into what God wants from each church family. Beginning in verse 13, Paul says, Until we all attain to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, to mature manhood, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, so that we may no longer be children tossed to and fro by the waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by human cunning, by craftiness and deceitful schemes. Rather, he says, verse 15, speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in every way into him who is the head in Christ. So in these verses, Paul has just finished discussing what? He's talking about why God has blessed each church with human leadership. And he says, here's what leadership is supposed to shoot for. He says, you need to help believers attain to this maturity of the faith. Maturity of the faith, that's huge. Mature manhood. He says, increase discernment. You don't want to fall for everything. He says, you, don't, you want to be able to spot what's false. You want to be able to reject it. And he says, finally... The leadership has to come alongside and they have to help the church grow up into Christ who is the head of the church. What does this kind of, church, what does this kind of growth look like on a practical basis? It's not about numbers. It's, it's purely spiritual. What does it look like? It looks like, well, an, a willingness, an increased willingness to give and receive forgiveness. A mature believer is one who can give forgiveness when they're wronged, and they can ask for forgiveness when they wrong someone. And so if you have mature believers in a church family, what's going to be the result of that? You'll have a church family that, where forgiveness is huge. They give and receive forgiveness consistently to one another. That's a sign of maturity. What else does it look like? A mature church is one who can handle the more complicated or the more difficult doctrines of the faith, and they can still apply them, right? They don't need the milk of the word 24-7 for 20 years at a time. They can handle the stuff that people find difficult. That's maturity. What else does it look like? It looks like selflessness in our relationships with each other, right? A very selfish person can never be a mature person. It looks like selflessness. These are the things that God equates with spiritual maturity. You see that none of it has to do with numbers. It's spiritual. And the truth is that no matter where we're at in our spiritual journey now, we can always grow in our faith and we can always grow in our maturity. No one has it totally figured out. No matter where we are, no matter how much we understand Scripture, we can always do it more, and we can always apply it better. Now, it's possible, and even probable, you could say that spiritual growth leads to numerical growth. But numerical growth is not supposed to be the focus. In the book of Acts, the Lord describes for us this first-generation church, the the earliest Christians, the early church, and he says that they grew rapidly, But the focus is not on the fact that they grew, it's why they grew. Why did they grow so quickly? Because they were on fire for God. They were fearlessly sharing the gospel with people. They made the right commitments. They were committed to biblical teaching. They were committed to prayer. They were committed to genuine fellowship. As a result of those right commitments, they grew. That's what the emphasis is on. If you try to think about numerical growth, but you skip over spiritual growth and maturity, then scripture says that we're missing the point. And you'll notice that this is captured in our covenant as well. It says, we're committing ourselves to the church's advancement. What kind of advancement? It says, we're committed to the church's knowledge, holiness, and comfort. We want to promote the church's prosperity and spirituality. Now, please look with me at 2 Peter, verses 5 through 8, which discusses this as well. Beginning in verse 5 here. 2 Peter, chapter 1, I sorry, chapter 1, verses 5 through 8, excuse me. For this very reason... 
Make every effort to supplement your faith with virtue, and virtue with knowledge, and knowledge with self-control, and self-control with steadfastness, and steadfastness with godliness, and godliness with brotherly affection, and brotherly affection with love. (laughs) For if these qualities are yours and are increasing, they keep you from being ineffective or unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. That's what spiritual growth looks like. You're climbing this ladder that starts with faith. This is what spiritual growth looks like in the life of a Christian. Now, I'll tell you this. Spiritual complacency is one of the worst things, perhaps the worst thing for a church. Spiritual complacency. You know, being really comfortable with where you're at, it's totally destructive. It's antithetical to a church's advancement. You know, take a look at your life. I need to take a look at my life. Are you really happy with where you're at spiritually? Are you really satisfied with where you're at spiritually? Are you satisfied with your relationship with the Lord? Are you satisfied with where this church is spiritually? None of us should be. None of us should be totally satisfied. We should always want to take the next step in our faith. No matter where we are, we can grow. Here's the second part of God's vision for church's advancement. That we become a family where all Christians can grow regardless of their current maturity level. That we become a family where all Christians can grow regardless of their current maturity level. This is huge. Now, one of the marks of a healthy advancing church is that the church is equally welcoming to all believers regardless of where they find themselves in terms of their maturity, in terms of their faith, right? We want to take the next step, and God wants us to become more faithful. He wants us to become more discerning, but he understands that we all have to start somewhere, right? We don't start off being mature. We have to grow. The church should be a place where we can do that. Every Christian should be able to benefit from the church in some way, and every Christian should be able to offer something to the church, no matter where you're at spiritually. Remember, God uses people to build the church, and he uses the church to build people. That's part of his design for it. We have to start somewhere. Now, there's an important balance here, right? When you first came to Jesus for salvation, we first placed your faith in him, you probably knew very little about Christianity. You knew very little about Christian doctrine. You probably knew very little scripture. But you knew that you wanted Jesus to save you and that you loved him. You, you knew that you needed to repent of your sins and trust in him. You had to start there, right? You took that first step of belief. It's the church's job to help you in your journey. The church has to come alongside you. The church has to help your growth. The church has to equip you. The church has to give you what you need to take the next step spiritually and then to take the step after that, to take the step after that. This is the church's responsibility. You know, there's oftentimes this perception in the culture, there's this perception that churches will only open their doors to believers who are already very mature. They'll only open their doors to people who have been saved for a very long time. And maybe this is the case with some churches. You know, maybe some churches are truly unwelcoming to new believers. But in every biblical church, they are going to be welcoming to believers at every level of maturity. Now, please take a look into Ephesians 4 with me again, this time just verses 15 and 16. We see how this is made clear for us. He says, rather, speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in every way into him who is the head, into Christ, from whom the whole body, joined and held together by every joint with which it is equipped, When each part is working properly, makes the body grow so that it builds itself up in love. I want to read that one more time. I'll really let this sink in for you. Speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in every way into him who is the head and into Christ, from whom the whole body, joined together and held together by every joint with which it is equipped, when each part is working properly, it makes the whole body grow so that it builds itself up in love. Now, we see in this passage, there's this presumption that you didn't come to church with everything figured out. You came to church with some learning to do. I came to church with learning to do. How is that? Because he says, we are to grow up in every way. You know, if we had already grown up, this command wouldn't make any sense. If we already knew everything that there was to know, this command wouldn't make any sense. There's this recognition that in every church family, there are people at every stage of spiritual maturity. And this is a feature of every healthy advancing church. You've got mature believers who are capable of teaching. 
right? You've got mature believers who can pour into people. They can train people. They can mentor them. They can disciple them. They can help them grow up in the faith. And then, on the other hand, you've got newer, less mature believers who can receive that guidance, and eventually they grow into maturity where they can have a ministry of their own. And the process repeats itself. This is a a healthy cycle that you'll find in every healthy church. There should be a place for every Christian in every church, right? Just like, you know, a healthy church is going to have people of every age, every age for sure. You've got older folks, you've got younger folks. A healthy church is also going to have people of every maturity level. Not that you're welcome to come here and remain the same. Not that you're welcome to come here and become complacent, but you're welcome to come here and grow and be changed and be shaped by what the church has to offer in Christ. This is part of God's vision for the church. Now, in the book of Romans, we see that some of the established mature believers uh, in the church had begun to judge those who were less mature than them, right? Rather than embracing them or rather than helping them on their journey, they had begun to look down on them because their faith wasn't as strong. In Romans chapter 14, uh, the apostle Paul directly addresses this head on. We're going to look at verses 1 through 3 and then drop down to verses 5 and 6. Paul says, As for the one who is weak in faith, welcome him, but not to quarrel over opinions. One person believes he may eat anything, while the weak person only eats vegetables. Let the one who eats, let not the one who eats despise the one who abstains, and let not the one who abstains pass judgment on the one who eats, for God has welcomed him. One person esteems one day as better than another, while another esteems all days alike. Each one should be fully convinced in his own mind. Verse 6, the one who observes the day, observes it in honor of the Lord. The one who eats, eats in honor of the Lord, since he gives thanks to God, while the one who abstains, abstains in honor of the Lord and gives thanks to God. He's basically saying, your level of maturity may lead you to embrace certain things and certain privileges. It may lead you to reject those things. Wherever you are in that, don't pass judgment on another believer who doesn't see it the same way as you. Even if you think that they're not going the same way because they are weaker than you, even if they are in fact weaker than you, he says, do not judge them, welcome them, embrace them, and don't welcome them so that you can quarrel with them, welcome them so that you can strengthen them, right? This is part of God's vision for the church, right? Christianity, you may come as you are, but you're not going to leave as you are. It changes you, it matures you, it convicts you. He wants to conform us into the image of his son, and he uses the church partly to accomplish that. Here's the third plank of God's vision. I'm sorry, there's one more thing that I want to say about this before we move on to that. A metaphor that I think is really helpful is that a church is oftentimes, you could think of it like a swimming pool, uh, in the sense that there's, it's got to have both a shallow end and a deep end, right? It's got to have both. Those who can already swim can jump in. They can go right to the deep end. Those who can't swim yet, they go to the shallow end. And they can wade and wade out a little further until they learn how to swim, until they get more comfortable. If it's all deep end, you're going to scare away those who don't know how to swim yet. If it's all shallow end, you'll never learn how to swim. You have to have both. Healthy churches have something for every depth. Stagnant churches usually only offer a single depth. Advancing churches offer something to every Christian. Here's the third plank of God's vision for our church. That we work to reach the lost in our community, that we work to reach the lost in our community. Now, I want to ask all of you a question. I want to ask all of us a question, and I want us to just think and pray about this over the next few weeks. You don't have to share your answer with me. You you don't have to share your answer with the elders. Just give it some thought. If this church, Franklinville FBC, disappeared overnight, how would it affect our community? I'll ask that again. If this church disappeared overnight, how would it affect our community? How would it change our community? Some of you might say it would greatly affect the community. You know, some of you, maybe all of your friends and all of your loved ones go to church here. Maybe this church is where you were raised. Maybe it's where you were married. You met your spouse. Maybe this is where you've raised your children and your grandchildren. Maybe you spent every summer up at camp. Maybe this is your community. That's great. That's fine. Others of you might say, well, if the church disappeared, it would only have a moderate effect on the community of Franklinville. You know, maybe some people would notice, some people wouldn't, life goes on. Some of you would say, honestly, I don't know if it would affect anyone outside of this room. Some of you might say that. How we answer this kind of question is very important, isn't it? When we think about the church's advancement, 
How tragic would it be if like this church were to disappear and it didn't have any kind of impact on the community? How tragic would that be? Have we advanced God's kingdom here in Franklinville? Have we advanced God's kingdom here in Cattaraugus County? To the extent that we can, have we advanced God's kingdom in western New York? Matthew chapter 9 describes a really critical interaction between Jesus and his disciples. Let's take a look, beginning in verse 36, please. Matthew chapter 9. When he, Jesus, saw the crowds, he had compassion for them because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. Then he said to his disciples, The harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore, pray earnestly to the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. I want to read that one more time. When he saw the crowds, he had compassion for them because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. Then he said to his disciples, the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore, pray earnestly to the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. Our vision for this church, and and really I believe God's vision for this church, is that we advance by reaching the unsaved and the unchurched in this community. And really, if we're going to be a faithful church, we have to take steps to do that. What are we reaching them with? It's the gospel, the the same gospel message that saved people 2,000 years ago, the same gospel message that will always save people. That's what we have to reach people with. This church should be the primary way that people in Franklinville hear that Jesus loves them. This church should be the primary way that people in Franklinville come to hear and understand the gospel message of salvation. This should be a priority for us. I want people to hear it up at camp. I want people to hear it in the youth group. I want people to hear it in Sunday school, in outreach efforts. This should be our main objective where God has placed us in this community. It's like it says right here in this mission statement. It's different from the covenant, but much the same language. What does it say, right? Together we lead the lost to Christ, disciple the found in Christ, demonstrate Christ's love by serving our community. We're really convicted that this is God's will for us. Now, what does this vision demand of us? What will it take to fulfill this? I believe that this requires two things. And without these two commitments, we can never be the church that God calls us to be. The first commitment is we must place the church family above ourselves. We must place the church family above ourselves. Have to. What is a healthy church? A healthy church is usually members and leaders who are committed to the church and they elevate the church above and over their own preferences. Not that we can't have a set of convictions and commitments that we agree on, but the convictions of the church are different than my personal preferences. And my personal preferences are far less important than the church's convictions and the church's mission. Right? We can never advance the church if we're only thinking about advancing our agenda. We can never be dedicated, dedicated to the church's holiness if we're first dedicated to our agenda. We have to place the church above ourselves. Now, why is that? Think back to the first sermon in this series when we looked at the idea of a covenant. We have to understand that the church is much bigger than any one of us individually. The church is more important. The church is more significant than any one of us individually, and that includes everyone in leadership. And certainly the kingdom of heaven is much bigger than any individual Christian. And it's bigger than any individual church. When we see ourselves as being really important, or we start to see ourselves as being irreplaceable, we start to think that we're a big deal for what God is doing here, we miss the magnitude and we miss the power of what God has built here. And what's so incredible about God's graciousness, we see this on display. God has built something here in spite of us sometimes. Sometimes he does it in spite of us, right? In spite of our shortcomings, he still builds things. In spite of our sin, he still builds things. He has sustained us even when we didn't love him the way that we should, even when we didn't take him seriously, even when we didn't love each other the way that we should, God still protected us. God has never let us feel the consequences really of our actions. He sustained us for almost 200 years now. I can guarantee you, For all those 200 years, there was never a stretch when we were doing everything perfectly, and certainly not for the last two and a half years. I could tell you that firsthand. We never have done anything perfectly, but because of God's love, he's upheld us. If we take our eye off that and we put our attention on ourselves, we miss the grace and the mercy that he has on display. 
What should our behavior look like in light of this? Please turn with me. Philippians chapter 2, verses 1 through 3 here. The Apostle Paul commanding the Philippian believers on this. And as we go through this, I want us to think, what does this look like here in 2024 in Franklinville? Paul says, so if there is any encouragement in Christ and any comfort from love, any participation in the Spirit, any affection and sympathy, complete my joy by being of the same mind and having the same love, being in full accord and of one mind. Now listen to this command. Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others as more significant than yourselves. And here's the final thing. The second thing that this demands of us we must be willing to serve and pray wherever there is a need. We must be willing to serve and pray wherever there is a need. Now again, the language of the church covenant puts it like this. We strive for the advancement of this church in knowledge, in holiness, and comfort to promote its prosperity and its spirituality. We strive for the advancement of this church in knowledge, holiness, and comfort to promote its prosperity and its spirituality. It is impossible for us to advance as a church without committing to the work that's necessary for that advancement, right? Advancement doesn't happen on its own. You're trying to get something done. You're trying to accomplish something in any area of your life. You want a healthier marriage. You have to put in the work for it. You want a stronger business. You have to put in the work for it. You want stronger friendships. That requires work. No, no kind of advancement happens on its own. It always requires labor and dedication. God calls us and he says to serve him wherever we can and he also tells us to remain in constant prayer for our fellow Christians. Now as we talk about maturity, I think that your prayer life and my prayer life can indicate to us in a way how mature we are, right? What do your prayers look like? Do, do you spend most of your prayers asking the Lord for things for yourself? There's nothing wrong with that. Do you spend most of your prayers asking the Lord to work in the lives of other people or to give them what they need or to minister to them? How selfless are your prayers, or what's the content of your prayers? I think the more mature we are in Christ, the less that our prayers honestly will be about us, the more that our prayers will be about other people and other relationships, right? And these are really simple acts of obedience. Scripture says that I think if we can commit ourselves to this, we could transform this church. In time, we could transform this community. And many times, the most effective churches, the ones that advance the most in this world, are just the ones who are devoted to these acts of obedience, the ones that are devoted to these simple acts. These churches are not always the largest. They don't always have the biggest budgets. They don't have the most attractive ministries. Uh, sometimes they lack ministries in, in terms of what they can offer, but they're sometimes the most faithful, the most committed to these acts of obedience, and they have the greatest impact on their community. Now, me and the elders have put these objectives forward over the last year or so, right? We've tried to give you more opportunities to pray for each other, to submit prayer requests, to know that they're being prayed for. We try to give you opportunities to get involved in ministry. Uh, we want to give you these things because we feel that this, in Christ, will make us a healthier, stronger church. In 1 Peter, the Apostle Peter is writing, and he warns us that we're rapidly approaching, even now, the end of all things. He says the end of all things is at hand. What are we supposed to commit ourselves to as we come to the end of things? He says two things, prayer and service. Look with me at 1 Peter 4, verses 7 through 11, as we come to a close this morning. He says, the end of all things is at hand. Therefore, be self-controlled and sober-minded for the sake of your prayers. And above all, keep loving one another earnestly, since love covers a multitude of sins. Here's this. Show hospitality to one another without grumbling. As each has re received a gift, use it to serve one another as good stewards of God's varied grace. Whoever speaks as one who speaks oracles of God, whoever serves as one who serves by the strength that God supplies, in order that in everything God may be glorified through Jesus Christ. To him belong the glory and dominion forever and ever. Now we see throughout scripture that God is going to accomplish his purposes, right? There's nothing that can stop God. There's no one who can stop him. He's going to accomplish what he sets out to do. Christ will return. He will establish his kingdom. He will 
judge the world in righteousness, and he saves anyone who asks him for salvation. He's capable of doing these things by himself 100%. He doesn't need anyone. He certainly doesn't need us. He's capable of doing all this. But he wants us to be part of what he's doing in the world. He certainly doesn't need us, but he wants us to be part of what he's doing. And more than that, he commands us to be part of what he's doing in the world. We have a responsibility to be obedient to him, not to just sit back and say, well, God's going to accomplish what he wants to do, so I'm just going to take the day off. We have a responsibility to participate in the work that God is doing in the world as he saves people. And where he's put us here in Franklinville, honestly, there's work to be done. If we don't do the work, no one is going to do it. The work will just not be done. No one is coming to bail us out. No one is coming to do it for us. If we don't reach the lost here, it won't happen. If we don't disciple the found here, it just won't happen. God has given us this responsibility to do it. In the book of Nehemiah, we see that Nehemiah is sent back to Jerusalem, and he is sent back with a commission to rebuild the city's walls and gates. They had been in a state of disrepair since the city was uh, sacked by the Babylonians about 70 years earlier. He's the one that has to rebuild it. And he recruits... When he does this work, he recruits all the men and all the families of the city to join him. It's too much work for one person to do. It's too much work for a couple of people to do. And these families start working together, shoulder to shoulder. They're rebuilding these massive sections of the wall. They're doing it together. And what's so incredible about this project is the book of Nehemiah records that these people were working, literally working in their backyards to rebuild this wall. They were working on the sections of the wall that were closest to their homes. And with each family doing that, they eventually had the entire wall rebuilt. They stuck at it until it was done and the city was secure. Because at the time, the city was facing increasing pressure and increasing threats and violence from the surrounding tribes who saw it as vulnerable. They got the, they got the wall rebuilt. I'm going to ask you this. Let me see just a show of hands if I can. Who here has used the church basement at some point? Yeah, just about all of you. Yeah, right? You've been blessed by it in some way, haven't you? you you've used it. It's, it's facilitated ministry. It's facilitated times of fellowship. It's been useful to us. Do you know how that basement came to be? I only learned this recently. You can correct me if I get this wrong, Russ, but I believe that in the 1950s, the people of this church dug out that basement by hand. Is that correct? Dug it out by hand. You know how much labor it takes to do something like that? How much sweat and toil? Dig out a basement by hand? I don't even want to dig a hole in the ground. <laughs> the way that it freezes around here, right? They dug it out by hand. Why did they do that? They wanted to create something for God that we could use decades later. They were devoted to the advancement of this church. Now let me ask you this. Do you think we could do something like that today if God told us to? Amen. Do you think we could do it? I hope so, right? If the Lord commanded us to and for his glory, would we be willing to put in the work to accomplish something of that magnitude? That's huge. It simply takes this commitment to service and prayer. And this is what God asks of us as he grows his church. So we think about this concept of church advancement, advancing in knowledge, holiness, comfort, providing for spirituality. This is much deeper than simply becoming a bigger church. It's much deeper than simply becoming a church that has more money. It's much bigger than that. It's about becoming a church that is devoted to God's word and devoted to obedience to God above everything else and leave the results to him. This is what he asks of us. And this is what our spiritual ancestors recognized when they put this into this covenant 200 years ago. We see that it's just as applicable for us today. Let's close with prayer. Father God, we love you so much. Lord, we thank you for the work that you are doing in this world. The work that you have done, we thank you that you are continuing to work today to draw people to yourself. We thank you that we can rest assured that you will accomplish those purposes. We thank you for the call that you've put on our lives to participate in the work that you're doing in the world. We thank you for the burden of advancing this church. We pray that we can deepen our spiritual maturity and our knowledge. We pray that we can deepen our obedience to you. We pray that this church can become a place where any Christian can learn and be changed, and any Christian can give and receive love. 
We pray that we would diligently work to reach the lost. Lord, I ask that you'd fill up this evangelism course in three weeks with people who are hungry to share the gospel. Lord, we're grateful for your sustenance of this church, Lord. Help us to make these simple commitments to you. Help us to put the church above ourselves and help us to put your kingdom above all. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Will you please stand as we close in song this morning? benediction from Revelation 22, which is the last chapter of the Bible, beginning in verse 14. Blessed are those who wash their robes so that they may have the right to the tree of life and they may enter the city by the gates. Outside are the dogs and sorcerers and the sexually immoral and murderers and idolaters and everyone who loves and practices falsehood. I, Jesus, have sent my angel to testify to you about these things for the churches. I am the root and the descendant of David, the bright morning star. The spirit and the bride say, come. And let the one who hears say, come. And let the one who is thirsty come. Let the one who desires take the water of life without price. Amen. Have a blessed week. Remember, uh, committee heads, we're going to meet in the Gorecki room in a few minutes, please.